I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we gather and pay my respects to elders past and present. Terry, Bindi and Robert Irwin, Australia Zoo representatives, alumni and students, members of staff, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Memorial Steve Irwin Lecture, the seventh such lecture given in memory of Steve Irwin this year as part of the World Science Festival. To start, just a little bit of housekeeping before we move on. God forbid there should be a fire. Follow me because I'll be the first one out. <laughs> and we'll congregate between the, the two large buildings out here. Toilets out through the doors, down the stairs to the right. It's my pleasure today to introduce Craig Franklin and Ross Dwyer, two members of the School of Biological Sciences. My name is Mark Blows, I'm the head of that school, and these are wonderful colleagues of mine. And they're going to be telling us today about the fantastic collaboration that they have with Australia Zoo and the Irwin family, and we're going to be talking and discussing crocodiles and conservation. It's going to be a real treat. I'm not going to say any more. I'm going to hand over to my very good friend Craig, and I'm sure he's going to entertain you. Thanks very much, Mark. I also would like to extend a welcome to everyone here. And I look around and I see there's a few first year students that I'm currently teaching. Sorry, no bonus marks for attending tonight. <laughs> but I'm really pleased that you were able to, to make this, uh, this seminar tonight. Really, this talk is in two parts. I'm going to be talking about conservation. And then Ross Dwyer, my research fellow, is going to be talking about crocodiles. And I just look at the full capacity that we have here, and it's a testament, I think, to the man that we're going to be talking about, and that is Steve Irwin. And if there are two words that epitomise Steve, it's crocs and conservation. It's near on 10 years that we lost Steve, and tonight's presentation is about reflecting on the past 10 years and what we have achieved in terms of continuing his legacy, his conservation legacy. But those two words, crocs and conservation, if you do a word cloud, I learned how to do that today, and you take text from the internet, then this is what turns up. Crocodiles, big and bold, conservation, conservationist. Car keys make, makes an appearance, although I don't know if Steve would like the colour of car keys. <laughs> and of course, crikey is represented there as well. I think it's a nice way to summarise and part of what Steve has contributed to, to our understanding of conservation. I first met Steve in the early parts of the century and we were both working independently up at Lakefield National Park. And I'd heard of this guy, of course, and had seen him on TV, but what I didn't realise when I got to meet him was how impressive he was in terms of his knowledge. It was outstanding. But what impressed me even more was his ability to question. In fact, it got almost irritating. It was question after question after question, and all the questions were informed because it was being drawn on his rich knowledge, his rich understanding of wildlife and of conservation. This is a, a really poignant photo for us. It's a family photo, and Steve, been described by many things, conservationist, but at the forefront for him was being a family man, with Terry and the kids. And the reason why this photo is poignant is that a week later we lost Steve, and it was the last family photo that was taken. In fact, I asked Steve and Terry, we've got a crocodile here that's, that's nice and calm, uh, why don't we have a family photo? 
and it holds very, very special memories, despite Robert looking slightly grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> Conservationist. Two other words I like to use to describe him. A researcher or a scientist. This creative ability to ask questions and to seek new information. And the other thing that I've put down there is educator or communicator. And these are the hallmarks of universities. And it was the hallmark of Steve. In fact, a quote of Steve's. I believe that education is all about being excited about something. Seeing passion and enthusiasm helps push an educational message. I think that's such a strong message, and I know that I take that on board every time. It's what drives me, is my passion and my enthusiasm, and there was a lot that I learned from Steve with regard to that. So our challenge over the last 10 years has been to recognise Steve's conservation legacy and to continue it, and that is a big challenge, given the impact he had on a global scale. So let's just go through some of the, the things that we have recognised and where we're going in terms of trying to continue Steve's legacy. I want to put this up first of all. Steve was posthumously awarded an honorary professorship from the University of Queensland, and that's not taken lightly. Regrettably, the letter had been sent to Steve in August, and he never received it. And so it was awarded posthumously. And that recognised his huge contribution to, to research and to education, again the hallmark of universities. We recognise his contribution through this memorial lecture set series. So it's been going now for seven years, and we've had some fascinating talks from Komodo dragons to Tassie devils to endangered species of frogs and reptiles. And again, with a clear conservation message. There's crocodile research that is ongoing that Steve started and we continue, and it's growing. I think pretty growing beyond his imagination, and Ross is going to give an amazing presentation about what we've achieved over the past 10 years. But just to reflect on his legacy, if you go to the literature, then you'll find a paper about all the methods that we've developed to track crocodiles, their remarkable homing and navigational ability, and their ability to travel vast distances. All will stand the test of time, and there forever, for people to refer back to. That's a great legacy in the scientific world. I also have to mention that Steve has a partner in crime, Terry, but also Robert and Bindi. And last year, in 2015, University of Queensland recognised Terry's contribution to research and education, and she was awarded an honorary doctorate. And I think this is a first, getting a photo <laughs> in your academic, academic gown, wearing car keys underneath, <laughs> and holding a woman python. It's, I think it's a great celebration of that achievement. And Terry, I know Steve would be enormously proud of what you've achieved. But what I want to highlight over the next 15 minutes or so is where perhaps we've had some of the greatest impact in terms of conservation here in Australia. Maybe unbeknown to you, but Australia Zoo runs three large conservation properties. But perhaps the jewel amongst them is a property aptly named the Steve Irwin Wildlife Reserve. I feel very privileged I'm the Director of Research for, for the, the reserve. And this reserve, which is located near the tip of Cape York Peninsula, about 100 kilometres from the tip, is a reserve that is in Tepetiki country. And I echo Mark's welcome to country. 
The Tepitiki are the traditional owners of this land, and what's neat about it is that their totem animal is the crocodile. And how fitting is it to be on their land working on their totem animal? It was, it came to, together in 2007. The Australian federal government of the time, the Howard government, acquired a pastoral station, Bertie Hall, as part of the National Reserve System or the National Heritage Trust. And in dedication to Steve's efforts, conservation efforts. And today it's, it's managed by the Terry Irwin Family Trust and, as I'll show you, a spectacular part of this country. It's large, 135,000 hectares, and the southern border of the reserve is the Wenlock River, a tropical river system that's probably as close to being pristine as any tropical river system in the world. Highly dynamic, in the monsoon season, it can increase in height by about 18 metres, and it's full of life. It's a spectacular river system. It's aesthetically beautiful. It has more species of fish, over 50, than, than than any other system in Australia, it's the most diverse. It's home to four species of sawfish. There are seven worldwide in total, and four occur in the Wenlock River. And it's also home to a number of endangered species. This chap here, the spare-tooth shark, only found in this river system here in Queensland. But if you move on to land, it's as equally as spectacular as the Wenlock River, and that the reserve is a mosaic of ecosystems, 35 ecosystems that include tall woodlands, the stringy bark forests that are associated with the bauxite, incredible rainforests, relic rainforests, swamps, and billabongs. And those ecosystems support a really rich biodiversity, plants and animals. Just some of the, th the animals you get to see along the way, an impressive array of amphibians and reptiles, a frilled-necked lizard, maybe perhaps a reptile you don't want to see, the death adder, legless lizards, file snakes, and a really impressive bird fauna. Here, the blue-winged kookaburra. Bowbirds with their collection of shells and human-formed objects. The rainbow bee-eater. And then there's the mammals, the characteristic antilopine wallaby and the spotted cuscus, all within this reserve and many, many more. In fact, if we were to do a count to date, and this, these numbers are increasing, then 44 species of fish have been described or found, 19 species of frogs, 47 species of reptiles, 175 bird species, and 20 species of mammals. And just to put that into perspective, in terms of percent of the Australian fauna, then we're looking at 16% of the freshwater fish, 9% of the frogs, 6% of the reptiles, a whopping one-fifth of the birds in Australia are found on the Steve Irwin Wildlife Reserve. So if you're a twitcher, it is the place to go if you want to tick off your list and, and quickly get, you know, 20%, 21% of the birds of Australia and 5% mammals. But also, 25 of those 35 ecosystems are of conservation significance. That includes a high number of endemic species on the reserve, at least 24 plant species that are threatened, 16 species of vertebrates that are threatened, and it's highly likely that we're going to be describing new species in the coming future. And that really does set the, the <coughs> excuse me, the backdrop to our mission. Since it was set up, we realise 
the enormous biodiversity that exists there, the variety, and our mission, which embraces Steve's legacy, is the reserve is set up for research and discovery, for education and training, to engage the local community, especially the indigenous community, the traditional owners, to assist in the development of land management strategies, and ultimately, to really lend a hand to conservation and the protection of biodiversity. But to do that, you need enormous support and logistics. And through enormous funding and logistical support from Australia Zoo and from Wildlife Warriors, we've set up a base camp. We've had the local community assist us and donors help us out in setting up a base camp for research. So it's simple, but it's effective. It's a place where we have amenities, a kitchen, effective communications, accommodation. This is our kind of tent alley down here. This is where we, we sleep. It's a place where we have briefing sessions at night time. It's a place, after a hard day's work, we can relax around the fire. But ultimately, it's a place where we support research. Researchers who go up there seeking new knowledge, brimming with questions, and being provided these amazing facilities that have created a hub for research on Cape York Peninsula. And the research projects are immense. And I've just listed them here, from biodiversity surveys to the Ascytus Institute at Griffith University, collecting plants, looking for new drugs, novel drugs that will assist mankind, to studies that are paleontological, archaeological, and to a whole array of species-focused studies. And if you look at the institutions and the universities that have been working on the reserve. I had to put UQ first. <laughs> I'm biased. The Australian National University, University of New England, Charles Darwin University. We have the herbariums, we have the Queensland Museum. We have CSIRO. I think that's really impressive in the space of a very short period of time to build such a hub of research activity. Regrettably, I don't have time to go through all those research projects, so I'm just going to cherry pick a couple of them. The iconic palm cockatoo. What a stunning animal. And the reserve has a good number of them, which is fantastic. And a young guy, Miles Neely, from the Australian National University, doing his PhD up there, is looking at communication and vocalizations in palm cockatoos. But palm cockatoos do something else that's really special. They use tools to create sound. And the males pick up branches, and then they bang them against hollow trees, tree stumps, and cause a drumming noise. And what Miles is interested in is looking at different populations on the Cape, the Sea Wild Wildlife Reserve being one of the key populations, and seeing the connectivity between populations or, or not. Great study. Just last year, we started the hunt for the northern quoll, a very elusive species, very difficult to spot, and Luke Burnett from Australia Zoo is conducting the study. They're really hard to find. So what Luke's doing is using motion-sensitive cameras to try and record them. He puts a little bit of bait underneath the camera. Chicken necks, I believe, is his source of food, and then hopes that he'll capture a northern quoll. You can guess what this is. <laughs> that was captured. You may better guess what those are. <laughs> and you may guess what they are. I'm pleased to say that Australia Zoo has really instigated a very good eradication program for these pest animals. And occasionally, we get to see our native species, the dingo, the echidna, and we even got a bit of a surprise in that 
an estrogar- crocodile was interested in the food as well. The elusive quoll is, is, is we, we, we haven't been able to capture yet. It's a work in progress, believe me. But perhaps the biggest impact we've had and a really special achievement is describing a new ecosystem. How often do you get to do that in your life, to describe a new ecosystem? Barry Lyon, the chief ranger on the reserve, was doing his surveys and came across these really small patches of rainforest. And they were associated with springs. And you can see these very small areas of rainforest from space. Hurrah for Google Earth. You can zoom into the reserve, and you can see almost these little tendrils here, a little bit of rainforest here and here, and streams running down to the Wenlock River here. They've been named, although I think we must have run out of names. We we have uh, no name spring. I don't know how that came about. Terry, you might better answer that question at the end. Eight have been discovered on the reserve, and since the research, many more have been discovered up on the Cape. And what makes these spring, springs so special is they sit at the base of a bauxite plateau. So the bauxite, this mineral that we extract to produce aluminium, forms these mounds. And this is just a relief map showing the springs located at the edges of the plateau, and probably best seen from this profile, where you can see the elevated plateau, and at the base of it are these springs. And they're very beautiful. The water comes out crystal clear, and it's the lifeblood of that rainforest. And what's remarkable about the water is that it comes out highly acidic, an environment that's extreme for most organisms, they shouldn't be surviving in water that is equivalent to acid rain in the Northern Hemisphere and is wiping out species. But yet, life abounds in the waters, and those springs support this incredible but small rainforest with native orchids and pitcher plants, a tiny little carnivorous pitcher plant here, possibly a new species. And then the wildlife, frog species, this iconic palm cockatoo. And what really brought this all together was this crazy Frenchman, Marc Leblanc, who's a hydrologist. And he came up onto the reserve, and together with ecologists and botanists and zoologists, put together a paper that described how these springs function. And I want to take you through it, because it is so special. So here's my cartoon of it. So we have this bauxite plateau here, and we have the springs at the base of it, supporting the rainforest and all that biodiversity. The springs are perennial. They run for the whole year. And the aquifer sits within the bauxite plateau. And what happens is when the monsoons arrive, that aquifer recharges. So during the wet season, the rain pours down. It filters through the bauxite and the underlying layers, changes its composition, makes it acidic, fills up the aquifer. So that during the dry season, which extends for upwards of eight or nine months, the springs are kept alive. And what this demonstrates is the connectivity between a very dry landscape, the bauxite plateau, where there's a stringy bark forest, and the rainforest. The two are connected. And in doing so, it supports this amazing amazing biodiversity. It's a fragile ecosystem. But perhaps the biggest impact this discovery had is it put to an end a mining lease on the Steve Irwin Wildlife Reserve. It was threatened by land clearing, total removal, 
And yes, they weren't going to go anywhere near the springs, but by removing the bauxite, you actually destroy the springs. And that was a massive achievement. It was a huge team effort from everyone, a huge discovery and a really exciting discovery. Conservation is about communication and education. It's a big part to conservation efforts, and we saw that with Steve's efforts. In 2015, a new project was born. We talk about conservation from the perspective of scientists and researchers all the time, but other people can take a key role in expressing that conservation, communicating that conservation message. And in 2015, four artists congregated on the Steve Irwin Wildlife Reserve, joined August, joined our Croc Month, and took inspiration from the environment. Those artists, painters Noel Miller and Annabelle Tully, painters, and two photographers, Russell Shakespeare and Robert Irwin. And what they're doing is documenting this amazing landscape, the Wenlock River and the Steve Irwin Wildlife Reserve through their work. And in doing so, providing another way in which we can get across a conservation message. And you just look at just a few images of the work and you start to realise it is another way of communicating the message. This is going on tour. In a few months' time, it's going to be opening up in the Channel Country, another threatened part of the world, where the artists will be showing their work. And a brilliant shot here of an Australian crocodile by Robert Irwin. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Ross, and he's going to enlighten you about the crocodile research that we're doing on the reserve. So, Ross, I'll bring you up here. <laughs> you okay. It's a real privilege to be here today, and thank you all for, for coming along. So, um, I never knew Steve. I didn't come out to Australia until 2011. But from working up in the field for the last five years with Terry, Robert Bindi, and the Australia Zoo team, I've heard so many stories, as you see. I've, um, I feel like I've got a good understanding of what an incredible man he was. So um, I'm Scottish, you probably guessed that. <laughs> uh, I'm back in Scotland, we don't have very many reptiles, I've got four. <laughs> right? And that includes the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> but back in 2011, Craig um, invited me to come out and work with him in Australia at the University of Queensland and um, to work on the largest reptile of them, of them all, the estuarine crocodile. <clears throat> One of these guys here. So if you, any of you are lucky enough to see a crocodile in the wild, this is the typical view that you would see, the nostrils and eyes just peeking above the water surface. You can imagine if there's a little bit of a ripple in the water or some vegetation floating by, quickly lose sight of these guys. <clears throat> but if you drop below the water surface, you see that's really just the tip of the iceberg. These animals are vast, the, the, huge, the whole body comes into view. And for a long time, this is, um, a, this is a really nice analogy for what we previously knew about crocodile behavior. Previous studies would be focal, would be from people being on the water's ba water bank, water edge, watching crocodiles, watching how they behave in the wild, keeping a safe distance, of course. But as these animals sunk down into the water, as they moved beyond the billabong and into the wild, we didn't really have a good idea about what they were doing and how they're behaving. So um, University of Queensland with Craig Franklin in collaboration with Australia Zoo, we've developed um, techniques on how to, to capture crocodiles, Capturing crocodiles isn't straightforward, even though these guys make it look that way. And we also developed methods of how to track these guys into the wild. What do they do once they disperse and, and move beyond? 
and we've, we've created the largest and longest running study on crocodile behavior anywhere in the world. We've tagged 139 crocodiles and we're tracking those behaviors over multiple years. So our story begins down in southeast Queensland, along the road at St. Lucia at the University of Queensland and up the road at the, um, on the Sunshine Coast at Australia Zoo. And every August, we get all our gear together and we head north to Cape York, the Steve Irwin Wildlife Reserve, showing in green here. So it's a massive process and a huge list logistical challenge, getting all the gear together. Last year, we had 72 people visit the reserve and nine four-wheel drives and 120 tons of equipment coming up on two trucks. Huge operation and a huge amount of work goes into this. It's thirsty work. On the reserve, we go through a lot of tea and coffee, 250 liters of milk, and we bring the gear to be able to set up our 18 crocodile traps. Why do we go there? Is to catch these guys. Crocodilus porosus, the estuarine crocodile, saltwater crocodile, or affectionately called the salty, the largest living reptile and top predator on coastal and freshwater systems from Australia all the way up to the east coast of India. When the team arrive, they get set, unpack all the boxes and start building the traps. The traps are strong and heavy enough to hold a large, um, large crocodile, but also light enough that you can cart them around the place. And the design of these traps were pioneered by, by Steve and his team back in the day. We've um, got vehicles that we can ship the traps around the place. You can see Nick and Amanda on the back of the barge here. And we, this is a floating trap. This is one which sits in the, in the middle of the water body. This is a land trap. This is one of our, our cage traps here. And the trap works by, at the back of the trap, down in this bottom left in the bottom corner, that's where the bait will be. There'll be half a pig or a, a haunch of beef. And then that would be connected to a trip which would run along the top of the, the trap. And when the crocodile goes into the trap, pulls the trip, the gate will shut. And we'll, and we'll get a guy. Um, you'll also see around the trap a bunch of sticks which have all been piled up. And that's not just for aesthetics. It's got a purpose. And the purpose of that is to make sure the crocodiles go through the front door. Crocodiles are smart and they'll find any which way to go into the trap without setting it off. It's the crocodile eye view, looking down the mouth of the trap. And if you look closely, you'll see two big footprints at the front, made by a large crocodile. Again, you see the barricades up at the side of the trap. So we've set up camera traps, like you saw of Luke Burnett's earlier on. And this is footage of a crocodile going through the trap, into the trap, captured by our most motion sensitive cameras. So you see this animal moving into the trap, taking his time, moving in, and then bang, we got him. We, th we think that crocodiles take so long to go into these traps, it's because they're, um, they're not ambushing the bait, they're following the scent from the water up into the back of the trap. And once we've got the crocodile in the trap, we've got to think of a way to get them out. And I've got a video here put together by Luke Burnett, um, which will give you a good idea of what happens and what's involved.
The guys make it look easy. So you would have seen a lot of different processes going on and getting the croc out of the trap, um, getting the crocodile close to the water and keeping him safe, and then us performing a series of um, scientific processes on him to, to attach the tags and release them into, back into the water. It's going to talk you through, just in a little bit more detail, the science that we're doing, the different steps that we do as part of the process. First of all, we measure the crocodile. Here we are here um, taking the, the total length of the animal from nose to tail. And if you look closely at those measurements, that really does read four meters, 68 centimeters long. These crocodiles are massive. Terry, for your benefit, that's 15 foot five. Okay. <laughs> so it's a real privilege to find yourself at the nose of such a large carnivore like that. It's a real rush and it's, it's something that sh you should never take for granted up on, up on the croc trips. Um, we also take a tissue sample. This is one of, from one of those little spiky bits on the back of the crocodile for scoots. And that, um, from that, we're able to look at how the crocodiles are related to one another and what they're feeding on. We also attach a couple of trans telemetric devices. We attach a GPS tag. You see here, I'm fitting one just onto the, the nuchal shield of the crocodile, just on his neck. And Terry kindly pinning the crocodile's head down for me. And these tags give us high precision, high accuracy fixes of how crocodiles are moving through space. However, the battery lives aren't great. They only give us information over a period of one year. So we've got a different type of tag. This is called an acoustic transmitter. It's about the size of your finger. And it's a lot, the battery life of these guys is one year. Oh, sorry, 10 years. 10 years is much longer. And these guys work. They give off a sound like an acoustic barcode. And these acoustic um, these get picked up by our acoustic barcode readers, our hydrophones, which are positioned throughout about 120 kilometers of river. So we're getting the movements of these crocodiles as they move past our array of acoustic hydrophones. And from this, we're getting long-term information on crocodile behavior. So once we release the crocodile and he goes back from the water's edge and sinks into the water, this is when the fun really begins. I'm an ecologist, I'm a data scientist, and I get really excited about getting stuck into the data and finding out what's going on. Um, so this is a, a brief animation. This is one of a quick animation that I drew up of how crocodiles behave in space. We've got this little triangle here, which represents the direction of movement of an a, um, adult female crocodile as she's moving throughout the river. You see, from her tagging site, she moves around. She's having a, checking out that section of the river. And then something triggers, and she goes heads downstream. <laughs> and what's interesting about her, she's a breeding female. And if you zoom right in, you can see she's sitting right on a nest on that, that site. So from the, the telemetric um, data we get back, we're really able to get a good insight into crocodile behavior. Crocodiles also move much further than the few kilometers within, within the Wenlock itself. I've created this animation of crocodile, this crocodile which was tagged in the Wenlock, and you can see the, the clock ticking up in the right-hand corner. And you see this animal moving in and out of the Wenlock River, moving up to 60 kilometers per day, moving up to 1,500 kilometers in a year. And this animal, you only stopped giving us location data um, a few last month or so. We get this information sent via satellites to my computer in, in Brisbane. And he'd moved 400 kilometers from where he was released. So to give you an idea of scale, that's the distance from here to Coffs Harbor, or here to Bundaberg. It's a massive distance. And you can see, for an animal which is so mobile, you can see why trying to manage them or how to predict when they're going to turn up is so challenging. How are they moving? Well, we found that crocodiles actually ride ocean currents to be able to facilitate their movement up and down the coastline. So crocodiles surf. When they're within the rivers themselves, they also use the tide. They're not smart, they're just clever animals. 
And when the tide's flowing in the direction they want to go in, that's when they move. So we see 95% of the time crocodiles move with the flow rather than again, um, 5% against the flow. <clears throat> so a qu common question that I get, I get asked is, how big do crocodiles get and how heavy are they? So they start off very small, a hatchling about 30 centimeters long, 50 grams. From small things, big things grow, and they can reach up to six meters in length. We had a six meter animal, which um, the largest crocodile ever captured was weighed, and he weighed well over a ton. That's how we know how much they weigh. This is a 20,000 fold increase in body size over the period of their life. Humans, from a baby up to an adult, it's a 30 fold increase. So as these animals are changing from small to big, their ecology starts to change. They behave differently, and they start to feed on different things. So I've got another animation here. I've overlaid, I think, six different animals. And we play this animation. You can see JK, she's the one that we saw before. You see her doing her movements. You see other animals, Gen N, which is headed way, way up into the fresh. Chase is doing a similar movement, and you've got Nikki and Dunk going and hitting heads against one another, trying to fight over this area of territory just in that, in the, um, that sort of southwest corner there. So what you should take away from this is crocodile movements from a small subset of animals is really complex. But if you start tagging more and more and more of these animals, 139 of these animals, you can start seeing these patterns start to merge. You should also take away from this that just because you're in fresh water up in the crocodile country doesn't mean you're safe. <laughs> so we see these interactions coming together. We can see crocodiles coming up and hitting one another in terms of space and time. And we're starting to dive further, further in into how these animals are behaving from the, the telemetry data we're gathering. <clears throat> we're starting to look at diet, what these animals are feeding on, and as they get bigger and bigger, from our stable isotope work that we're doing on the animals' tissues, we're starting to see where in the food web they're feeding. We're seeing the small animals are feeding on um, small vertebrates and small invertebrates around the water's edges and fresh. As they get bigger, they start feeding on larger and larger fish and sharks and rays. And as they get bigger again, they then switch from feeding fish to targeting these terrestrial vertebrates, these terrestrial herbivores. And we're finding crocodiles are very generalist as a species. They feed across this broad array of different dietary sources. But as an individual, they target specific food sources. We also do a more direct measure of looking at how um, crocodiles are interacting with their prey by going out and tagging a whole suite of the potential prey items. This is a project that we've just started, and we go up to the Wen working on the Wenlock, we're, fight we're working, doing lots of fishing to, <laughs> to try and tag as many sharks, rays, barramundi, sawfish, any of those prime food resources sources that these guys um, could be preying on. You can see our acoustic, range of acoustic tags that we, we've got down in the bottom um, right-hand corner here. So these direct methods of looking at crocodile interactions with a prey. So we've spoken about how crocodiles interact with their other crocodiles, with the environment, with the prey resources. What's left? How crocodiles interact with people. So there's no beating around the bush. Crocodiles are a large predator, and they exist in an area where the human population is growing. So what we found, if you go through the archives, if you look at the croc attack database, in the last 10 years, since 2000, there's been 293 fatalities from estuarine crocodiles. This is in, in, throughout their whole distribution from Australia up to India. In Australia, in Australia alone, there's been 14 in the last 16 years. So uh, you have to talk about crocodile human interactions. So what we're doing, we're using our tag data from our tag crocodile, our data from our tag crocodiles to look at how crocodiles are interacting in human habitat. And we're also looking 
at human behavior and see how humans are interacting in crocodile habitat. You need to look at both sides of the coin here. <clears throat> so if you go up to northern Australia and you're on the rivers, you'll come across these signs. Do not swim in crocodile habitat. But if you're on the river and you're in these areas, you see people commonly do. It's very, very um, uh, typical to see a scene of people swimming in one of these waterholes. And we focused on one of these waterholes and looked at how people and how crocodiles were interacting there. So we've got our data from our tagged crocodiles. And as much as I'd love to go out and tag people, I love tagging things, I do. <laughs> as much as I'd love to go out and tag people, we can't do that. Human ethics is a nightmare. So we conducted a survey. We, we conducted the, the great Weepa Crocodile Survey, where um, Australia Zoo and Tackle World kindly gave us some gear that we could, we could put out as an incentive for people to get back to us to tell us um, how they behave around crocodile habitat. And we asked them a whole suite of questions. One of those questions was, um, is there a particular time of year that you would not enter the water because of crocodiles? And people came back to us and said, of course, night time. Don't go in the water at night, it's stupid. <laughs> and then we looked at our tag data from our crocodiles and we find, sure enough, the frequency of times that crocodiles are in this area that people like to swim in is much higher at night, represented by the blue bars here. But there is um, times where the crocodile is there during the day. We then asked, stage of tide is an important factor determining whether or not you enter the water. They all came back and went, nah, it's not important. No, it doesn't really matter when we go in the water, as long as the fishing is good. But from the, tag of the tagging data from the crocodiles, we find it's very dangerous to go in that water at high tide. And the reason why I think that is is because crocodiles, you know, they're quite cautious animals. They don't like being out of the water, and they're, they're waiting for the water to be above their backs before they cross over this this, um, this, this popular um, watering hole. Last question we asked, is there a time of year that you would not enter the water? Only 16% of people identified September to December as being a critical time. And these are very informed people because they knew that this is the crocodile breeding period and this is the time that crocodiles move most. So there's a real disconnect there between what people know and how crocodiles behave. <clears throat> so when we started off on this study, we've, we've really, I mean, there's, there's lots of literature out there on crocodile behavior, but we, we really didn't have a full grasp of how these animals are behaving in, in the th over long time periods. From our tracking data, we're showing that they're moving great distances at great speeds and using the environment to be able to, to ride to the locations they want to go. And this is really important when you bear in mind that the Queensland government are creating crocodile-free um, areas down the east coast of Australia. And these are well within the 400 kilometers that we've seen our tag crocodiles move on year upon year upon year. So really, can you guarantee safety when swimming in areas which have been told to you that you're safe to swim there. Another, another policy which we get um, asked about a lot is um, trophy hunting and crocodile removal from, from, from areas of prime crocodile habitat. But we're a bit worried about this because we've seen that um, these large crocodiles that you get in the systems, we call them boss crocs, we, we feel that they create this, some sort of social cohesion in the system, and they actually reduce the amount of movement that you, that you get of these other sort of three and a half, four meter long animals from coming and moving up and down the river. So if you start pulling out these large animals without knowing exactly what um, consequence it has, it might actually make matters worse. We also don't know what, re what effect removing crocodiles has on the biodiversity of the whole of the rivers. If you go up and you speak to fishermen up there, they say the best bar of fishing is in areas with, with healthy crocodile population. What happens when you remove the crocodile? Is there cascading effects right down the, the, the food web? We don't really know. But what we can do is we can look at other examples of large predators and large carnivores from across the world 
and look at their stories and see what happened when they got removed from their systems. In North America, they have a much better database what happened when they removed wolves to what happened in Australia when we removed crocodiles. So we have to be very careful before we make these decisions. We should also embrace crocodiles. We're very lucky to have a top predator, such an amazing animal living just, you know, a flight away. <laughs> it's an amazing thing to see, and it's, it's, it's something that I encourage everybody to see. It's, it's, it's quite incredible seeing these guys in the wild. You should be proud to be Australian, to have your Australian crocodiles. <clears throat> I like to, always like to round up my, my talks with a quote, and this is a quote from um, the f famous ecologist, um, Edward Rowe Wilson, um, a man who knows a thing or two about a thing or two, as my friend Barry Lyon would say. Um, he famously said, um, we are not afraid of predators, we're transfixed by them, prone to weave stories and fables and chatter endlessly about them, because fascination creates preparedness and preparedness survival. So knowledge is power, and we need to know how crocodiles are behaving, what drives crocodile behaving, and how humans are behaving, and only from knowing this are we able to make educated decisions and choices in how we manage the crocodile population, and how we conserve them and other species. So I'd like to acknowledge um, University of Queensland and World Science Festival for putting on this event. For our, our funding body, the Australian Government, Australian Research Council, um, with our linkage partners, Australia Zoo and CSIRO. Hamish Campbell, who's my um, good friend and colleague and brother, and he's, um, <laughs> uh, we, we work together on a lot of this stuff. Um, and Australia Zoo for all their support up in the field and being such a a bunch of guys, and particularly Terry, Robert, and Bindi for, for, um, for being so supportive of the research. And we, um, Craig started on a quote from Steve, and I'd like to finish on one, which is, yeah, I'm a thrill seeker, but crikey, education is the most important thing. And he's right, he's right, because people up north, people which live in with crocodiles don't actually know, and they've not been told how these animals are behaving, and we need to change that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Craig and Ross, for a fabulous set of talks. Before we move on to some questions from the audience, I'd just like to get Terry Irwin up here to give us her perspective on the research and this collaboration. Wasn't that amazing? And what a great night. Look at how many people are here. Hmm, I think I'll have to say crikey. <laughs> There's a lot of people. I'm very impressed at the, the interest. Thanks so much to University of Queensland and the great team for putting this on. It's a fantastic event, well run, great food, good people, well organized, absolute perfection. So thank you so much for a great night. I would like you to spare a thought for Ross's potential children, who will not get away with anything because he will have them all tagged. <laughs> so um, I do also notice this interesting thing about the University of Queensland researchers. They all seem to be incredibly tall and very handsome. <laughs> I'm not sure how we worked that out, but good for us. We've got our Croc team here as well, with the exception of the international women that we have in the group, all a bunch of handsome blokes as well. And it is International Women's Day. I'm very proud to be an international woman. And to, um, to say uh, International Women's Day and week and month and year is also about men. Men are pretty terrific. We can learn things from men. And I certainly have. I liked what Robert said when I was in a tourism meeting in America recently. They were talking about all the things Steve had accomplished and all the things I'd accomplished with him. And Robert said, well, you know, behind every great woman, there is a great man. 
Robert, you nailed it. It's true, and I'm very thankful for all the years that I had with Steve, because he was a great man. And I really appreciate who I'm working with now. The University of Queensland is the best university, but I have to tell you, I really like working with Craig and Ross. Craig's a fantastic teacher, and you can be the best researcher on planet Earth, but unless you tell a good story and you can impart the information well, none of the rest of us get it, you know? You can talk about trophic cascading of animals, and we all go, well, that was really interesting. Or I can explain to you how, like in Yellowstone National Park, the reintroduction of wolves means they ate more animals that ate the plants, which affected the water systems, which means the rivers are healthier, the plants are different, the prey animals are under control, and it's all because of the wolf. Now do you get it? That's what that means. And Craig's a fantastic teacher, so he explained it very simply when he said, Let's look at crocodiles as apex predators, top of the food chain. What does that mean? Well, if you took the roof off this building and you didn't change anything else inside, for starters, we'd be soaking wet. But everything in here would eventually be destroyed. So I thought, geez, that's a really good way of explaining why crocodiles are important. I get it now. I get why there's mud crab and barramundi where there's crocodiles. So that's why apex predators are so important. And nowadays, it's harder to find an apex predator than it is to avoid one. So we don't have the same problems and challenges. I do think it's interesting in Australia because we're all like, watch out, we have the top 11 most venomous snakes in the world and the largest crocodilian on the planet. And in Africa, they say, we've got the big five, all of which can kill you, but people spend billions of dollars collectively every year to go look at them. So how about we think about that? How about we think about our platypus and echidna and little rabbity things that are called kangaroos that are so weird and cool, and our awesome crocs and our amazing venomous snakes and all of our beautiful wildlife and promote it. I think that's really important. I also really like Ross because of his enthusiasm. Now, Craig's this great teacher, but he's not terribly goofy. <laughs> Ross is so hilariously passionate. So I remember we were up on the Steve Irwin Wildlife Reserve and we're all like trying to support Craig and Ross with everything they're doing. And Ross said, I'm doing isotope studies with crocodiles so I can find out what they're eating. And some of the things he's learning is really cool. Some of the bigger crocodiles seem to actually be sitting at the crossings and when the tide changes, they just turn around and then get all the fish. And then the tide changes and they just do this and eat all the fish, which is way easier than trying to sneak up on stuff. Just turn around. So how interesting that sometimes even big crocs are eating small things. Fascinating. But in order to determine that, you have to get a sample from the fish. And not that kind of fish, but the fish from the Wenlock River that the croc would be eating. Okay, so as you can imagine, crocs don't just eat fish. So now I'm going, cool. What can we collect? So we're just collecting everything and taking samples. We caught a blue tongue lizard and trimmed its toenails. Ross took it all home. We, we, uh, there, there's an, there was an echidna in my camp and I took toenail clippers and got one of its quills. That was cool. And I'm like, you know, I've seen them eat fruit bats. I know they eat a lot of fruit bats. And there was a fruit bat colony one year up there, you know how they just all move in? There's a bazillion of them. So I go, look, let's go to the colony because there's like thousands of them. So there's gonna be dead ones and we'll get you a fruit bat. And Ross is like, cool. Only he doesn't say cool because he's Scottish. He's like, aye, let's get some haggis and go get a fruit bat. <laughs> so we're like, great, let's do it. So we go out in this fruit bat colony and we're walking around and they're of course in this, the, tree, the, um, the trees in this swamp. And so we're walking around the swamp, and it's, it's deep, and hey, guys, Bindi and Robert were helping. And yeah, so it's deep water and, and swampy, and because the fruit bats have been there for a long time, there's a lot of guano, and it's starting to smell, and we're walking around, and the fruit bats have these funny little parasites that are, you know, little flat flies are dropping on your head, and it's really interesting. 
So after, after about 15 minutes, there were no dead fruit bats. After about half an hour, I'm starting to feel kind of sick, and there's no dead fruit bats. After an hour, I pick up a stick, and I look at a fruit bat, <laughs> and I ponder it. But I thought for sure we could find one. All of a sudden, I hear Bindi go, over here. And this goshawk flew over with its kill, which was a fruit bat, and no word of a lie dropped it at Bindi's feet. <laughs> so we all rush over, and we look at this dead fruit bat that was like gift from God, goshawk. <laughs> and we're so excited. But Ross is the most excited. So he's like squealing. <laughs> he comes over and he's like, okay, I'm just going to take this little sample. And he puts it in his little bag and then he's like, I'm just going to get one more little sample. <laughs> and pretty soon this poor little dead fruit bat's in tiny little pieces in his plastic bag. But that's the enthusiasm that is so amazing to me. So he takes home all of his little fruit bat pieces and he's going to find out how many crocs are eating how many fruit bats. It's fascinating. And I love that about science. I love that no matter what your passion is, you can get involved with science. You know, you don't have to be the smartest or the tallest. <laughs> we can all contribute to the science that is so important it will protect people, it will protect our environment, and it will protect our future, and we can count on it. So we need to be good researchers, and we need to be good storytellers. And if you'd like to be part of it, we have a couple of special events going on on the Steve Irwin Wildlife Reserve this year. One is a photography expedition starting at the end of July, and you can go look at all those one out of five bird species and all that cool stuff. And the other is a research expedition the first part of August, where you can see what the different types of researchers are doing, as well as finding out more about crocodiles, which is so important. But I was so lucky because I got to do all of this with Steve. And it was fun to be there from the beginning because I want you to stop and think that when I met Steve, he wasn't the crocodile hunter. He was just Steve. And when I went into Australia Zoo in 1991, it was the Queensland Reptile and Fauna Park, and I went in, and at the time that I visited, it was about two acres. I met both the staff. <laughs> they were lovely. And this guy was doing a croc show feeding crocodiles, and talking about them in ways that I'd never thought. He said they're very good mothers, extremely protective of their young. And I thought, wow, I never knew that. That's really interesting. And he said they're very passionate lovers. To each other, they're very affectionate, which is incredibly special and remarkable. And so in hearing him talk about crocodiles, I was really moved. And growing up in Oregon, we don't have any crocodiles. I, I caught um, a salamander once, and I was hoping it was a baby alligator, but it was a salamander. <sighs> yeah, that's what I did. I was like, <laughs> holy dooly, I dropped my glass. <laughs> I was in shock, too. It's cool. But it was a salamander. And... And so to hear about crocodiles, it was really a new thing. Now, the zoo was so small at that time, there were probably 12 people in that day. So I stood out in the crowd. <laughs> and Steve's eyes caught mine, and because he was only human, <laughs> he instantly fell desperately in love. <laughs> and we got to talking, and in spite of the fact that he was a fairly good-looking bloke, I just had this sense that I wanted to build a campfire and hear more stories. That's how I felt. I just wanted to hear him talk about all of his adventures in the wilderness and the things that he'd done and how much he loved wildlife. It was very compelling. So when we got married, instead of a honeymoon, we filmed our first documentary. I spent my honeymoon with six men. <laughs> Wasn't that a treat? And. 
And I remember when we caught a crocodile that someone was trying to shoot, they'd shot dead the male and they were trying to shoot the female, so we caught her. In those days, we thought we could relocate crocodiles. But she was about nine and a half feet long. I'm fresh out of Oregon. We've just gotten married. I mean, just gotten married. I'm going, this is the most amazing man on planet Earth, and I can't believe it. And he just caught this crocodile, and it's so cool. <laughs> so I'm standing there going, this is just awesome. And she's in this mesh trap, and Steve goes, Roy, you jump her head, and I'll get the net off her. And I'm like, what? <laughs> jump her now. I'm like, what? So the next thing you know, I flung myself on a nine and a half foot crocodile. I'm holding onto her head. He's working the trap off her. I can feel her breath blowing my fringe. At the time, they were still called bangs. And I, I remember thinking, her breath is odorless. It's just kind of warm air. And it was the most special and amazing thing because I'm laying on a dinosaur. <laughs> it was mind-bogglingly incredible. And you know what? They're chubby. She had like a little chubby neck. You know baby legs? How you just got to squeeze them? They have little chubby necks and little chubby legs and little soft tummies. And once you've gotten handfuls of that chub, you can't imagine turning something like that into boots, bags, and belts. You can't even fathom it. So that's when I first started my love affair with crocodiles. I just love them. They are fascinating animals. And when you talk to Craig about the physiology of crocodiles, you'll find out how amazing they are. You know, they can lower their heartbeat to like three beats a minute, and they have a four-chambered heart like ours. How do they do that? That's for Craig to tell you another day. They can hold their breath for hours. Is, it, is our length of time confirmed? Can we say? Seven? I think it's eight. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's more than eight. But it hasn't been confirmed yet by the scientists. <laughs> and, and they're just the most amazing animals. So what I want you to do is I want you to stop and think about it don't be a speciesist. Don't say eagles are cool and vultures are icky. You know, koalas are beautiful and crocodiles are slimy. Don't be a speciesist. You need to learn to love all animals equally. And I remember Kalia Ali, one of Muhammad Ali's daughters, said Steve was like the Gandhi of wildlife. He just loved them all. And that's what I think we need to do, is learn to love them all. And then maybe we'll have a beautiful world for generations to come. So thank you so much for coming tonight. And I think we're going to do the panel thing. Hey, thanks, guys. Okay, guys, we're going to get into a bit of Q&A. Who's going to ask the first question? We have a microphone that's going to come and, come Where and follow you. Where are my first year students? <laughs> what did I say in first year lectures? You've got to ask questions. No questions? Oh, here's one. This looks like a Dorothy Dixon from a UQ staff member. <laughs> no, it's really not. <laughs> Um, I was just curious, looking at the footage when you were, had caught the crocodiles and you were releasing them, that they always went straight into the water. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone was standing around. It, it, is there, was there a trick there that made them go straight into the water or was that just the luck of the footage that we saw? <laughs> Terry, you can answer that one. Um, had to move it around a bit because it had flipped around a lot and it's blindfolded to settle it down. And we let it go and it turned exactly around and just took off into this savanna. And, and Steve finally said, we all have to leave and it'll reorient itself to the water. But what's really cool is these guys have tracked large crocodiles going up to three kilometers over land. So they are functional on land. 
They're aquatic predators that primarily stay in the water, but they can come out on land. And it is very scary, so you have to be ready to run in case they, especially with smaller ones, in case they turn around and go the other way. But our team's really amazing at getting them right by the water and being really, really safe. And all of our crocodiles, hey Craig, through all of our history of catching crocs have been released safely and, and if anybody gets hurt, it's usually falling into the boat or something. <laughs> it's not croc related, so it's really good. Next question. Oh yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I'd just like to um, ask about the crocodiles when they're out in the ocean, like I've seen like about 40 kilometers or 60 kilometers out in the ocean, just swimming around, um, going somewhere maybe, or just a, a pattern that they have? Am I on? Well, I'm on. Um, yeah, so, so if you look at the estuarine crocodile, what's remarkable about it is its geographic range. And so, as, as Ross pointed out, from the east coast of India up to the Philippines to Vanuatu, and that gives an indication that they are able to travel large distances. We haven't had any go out of Australia, but they're quite comfortable living in the marine environment, and they're, they're designed for it. What's amazing about the mouth of a crocodile, if you open it up and have a close look inside, carefully, the, the tongue is a, a desalination plant, it's a salt gland, and they can drink seawater and then excrete a really concentrated salt solution uh, to enable their water balance. So we've tracked them off the coast, I think 30 or 40 kilometres as well. Yep. Has there been much research into the depths at which crocodiles can can swim, how deep are they able to, yeah. to swim? So um, that's research that um, we did with Steve and uh, on the very last trip together, we were fitting crocodiles with a really sophisticated tracking device that enabled us to look at its behaviors underwater and in three dimensions. And I think from memory, the deepest water hole that we recorded an animal in was about 16 metres. So they can sit down at depth, and as Terry pointed out, they can stay down there for a very long period of time. Seven <laughs> hours. <laughs> Seven <laughs> hours. Did you get that? <laughs> Not eight. <laughs> Not eight yet, OK? <laughs> Hi, um, Cape York is a place where um, conservation, development and indigenous land rights really come together or come into conflict. And without asking you to speak on behalf of indigenous people, um, can you comment on, on that conflict and your experiences talking to traditional owners? working with the Tepetiki and the Adambaya people. And first of all, in regard to the animals, uh, different clans have different totems. So that affords protection for different animals. And that reverence for the animal is really special. The second thing is on this particular reserve, there are places that I'm allowed to talk about. They're um, story places. And we know that anywhere you have water is a traditional story place. Um, but the, the Borksite Plateau with the emanating springs is like the birthplace of, I guess you'd say, life. And, and it was really amazing because they were like, whoa, the deal is men can't touch the water. So it's really funny when Robert was particularly little, he thought something really bad was going to happen to him if he touched the water. So he'd be walking around the water very carefully because it's a woman's place, it's kind of a birthing place, and it's very special. We're working with the Ascaitis Institute as well on um, the plant research, and traditional medicine is helping us to collect the correct vegetation to study with our um, Western medicine to find pharmaceutical values. So we're going back to the traditional people too. 
um, the indigenous people to find out the, the value of different plants and then studying that today. So there's a lot of um, teaching and learning. A lot of the uh, young people, um, the, the younger ranger programs with the indigenous kids is really getting kids back on country which is very important as well. So those are kind of the things involved with the indigenous people. Most recently, we had a fire workshop and 107 uh, indigenous people from Tasmania to Western Australia to everywhere came and talked about um, traditional burning and how to keep the land from having hot burns and being very destructive. So all those things are, are integrated in as well, definitely. Do the crocodiles um, come up to the nest every year? He wants to know if crocodiles are like turtles and come back to the same nesting area every year. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, good question. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> that, that, that's the, the real benefit of undertaking like, long-term study, um, long-term tracking programs. So the acoustic tags that we use have a 10-year battery life, and because it's got such a long battery, such a big battery inside, we can track their movements as they move the, throughout the river, and do they always go back to the same area at the same time of year? So it's only from doing these long-term studies that we're able to s answer questions like that. <laughs> Give me six months. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> Yes, there are cane toads on the reserve. Thankfully, they're not in large numbers and very few around the, the springs. We, we don't have any evidence to say that um, the crocodiles have been affected by cane toads, but clearly in other regions in Australia, they have had enormous impact, especially on freshwater crocodiles. Yes, there are freshwater crocodiles um, on the Wenlock River, but um, in terms of impact, we, we have no evidence to say they, they have an impact, direct impact, but we do know that um, they eat, especially our, our amphibian fauna, they're ferocious, so they will be having some, some impact. We just haven't studied that. That's a good question. Hi, um, I just am um, curious if um, Australian con um, institutions also cooperate with um, other agencies in our neighboring countries in the regions where these crocodiles exist. Like for example, the Philippines, um, there's Lolong. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but yes. there's a big, the largest ever court. And it just passed away like a couple of years ago or a few years ago. And I think, um, if um, the agencies were able to care for it better, then it would have um, survived longer. And I'm, I, I'm just wondering if our institutions are also exchanging information and you know, training other people in other countries on how to preserve these crocodiles. Yes, there's, there's still a long way to go, but, but yes, it's an international community. Um, and through publishing, through the scientific literature, we communicate our findings, produce evidence, whether it's the ecology or the behavior um, or management practices, and there are regular exchanges through um, scientific meetings. So I've met people from the Philippines, I've met people from Indonesia, and we all communicate. And I think the wonderful thing that I think we feel very proud about uh, from Steve's time is that the work that we've been doing is informing management and conservation strategies in other places in the world. I mean, there are other species of crocodilians that are so threatened. The Chinese alligator, possibly 200 left in the wild. 
And what's really, I think, assisted a lot of people is the technology and the tracking devices that, that we have developed for crocodiles. And so the paper that Steve was heavily involved in, that we published shortly after um, he passed away, has had huge impact because people were using it as a guide to track the Orinoco crocodile or the Cuban crocodile. Uh, so that's, that's where we can have impact and on a global scale. Can I, just, can I just mention, yes. sorry, also, um, Steve developed at Australia Zoo the Crocodile Rescue Unit. So we've got a team of people that will respond anytime a government, I keep wanting to stand up, anytime a government has a problem with a crocodile. So in other words, we got a call at Australia Zoo one time and someone said, uh, they're keeping an alligator at this pub in Texas, can you help it? We're like, well, we can't go to every pub in Texas and do something about that alligator. But we've gone, we've responded from Sri Lanka through East Timor, Vanuatu, through the South Pacific, all the way to Mexico with dealing with crocodile rescue. So if there's a crocodile like Lolong that's been doing something naughty, if a croc's been eating livestock or um, people even, there's four things that we do. So the first thing we've got to do is take care of the crocodile, and that may be moving it into a captive situation. The second thing we want to do is find out what the problem was. Do we need a fence so the livestock can't get to the river? Do people need a well so they don't have to go to the river to get water to wash their clothes? So we fix the problem for why there's a conflict. The third thing we do is put signage in the local language. Um, we, in Indonesia, there's signage in Bahasa where it says, you know, you don't swim here, there's crocodiles, so that people know. And the last thing we do is an educational component. So like in Cambodia, we were dealing with crocodilians and then went into orphanages and schools where the kids would draw pictures of crocodiles and talk about how proud they were and what they'd learned about crocs, and they know they can't swim with them. So interestingly enough, if we did those four things in Australia and got rid of the exclusion zones with crocodiles, everything would be fixed. We could remove problem crocodiles. We could protect people with fencing. We could then put signage up to help people understand and then educate more in our school systems. So I'm, I'm a real advocate that we stop trying to make things we're scared of go away. We can't keep doing that. We need to learn how to live with them. And those are the four things that we've been doing for many, many years, and we'll continue to do so. So thank you. All right. Um, two things. Uh, so Bob, Bindi, and, and, and Terry, first of all, this is my son, Nick. Uh, we're from Denmark. He's now being supervised by, by Craig, and uh, he would not be studying zoology if it wasn't for you guys. We come from Denmark. We watched you on TV, and he was dreaming of it when he was younger. And... Uh, that's why he's here now. That was a, that's a fair, that's a fact. That wasn't a question. Here comes a question. <laughs> a, a couple of years ago, we had uh, one or two crocs up in the uh, Mary River, I believe, not far from here, really. Is there any evidence to, to, to prove or show that the crocodiles are faring further south due to increasing maybe water temperatures or anything like that? Okay. One of the first things that, that you may not know is that crocodiles used to be in the Brisbane River. Um, but the most northern breeding population is the Fitzroy River, so near, near Rockhampton. What we do know about crocodiles and their physiology is that temperature is a, is a major determinant of their, their movement and their distribution. And in the face of climate change, of global warming, then I would hypothesise that we will see more and more crocodiles come further south because that temperature, the increases in temperature will allow them to, to move into more um, southern or higher latitude waters. So that's what I would, I would predict. Um, that's not going to happen possibly in my lifetime, but um, we need to be prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Um, could you please join me in thanking Terry, Craig and Ross. <laughs> <laughs>